Morning, uh, committee will come to order. Welcome uh, to our first uh, committee markup for fiscal year 2019 appropriations cycle. Uh, this morning, I hope it's this morning, we will continue the fiscal year 2019 military construction and veterans affairs bill as well as the legislative appropriations bill, branch appropriations bill. By the end of the week, the committee will have held nearly 75 budget hearings, including opportunities for all members to make their marks on our bills. The power of the purse lies in this Congress, and it's our job to make spending decisions on behalf of the American people. Such oversight hearings help us draft bills like the two we're marking up today. I want to thank all of you, the members and the staff, for your hard time and hard work completing this this, uh, this effort, particularly over such an abbreviated time period. In particular, I want to thank Ms. Lowy for ongoing partnership and commitment to the appropriations process. We've been on the committee together for a long time. We're proud of its historic role and its history of bipartisanship. In marking up the fiscal year 2019 appropriations bills, we'll be marking to the overall 302A totals is set forth in the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018 that was signed into law in February. The total levels in military, construction, VA, and ledge branch bills before us today are fully consistent with the numbers and principles of the BBA. The full committee will consider the 302Bs in a subsequent, subsequent committee meeting. Before we turn to the, to the matters at hand, it's time for our annual Reminder about our flower fund, which is used to send flowers or food baskets to families of a member who's experienced an illness, lost a family member, or is celebrating the birth of a child. I encourage each member to make a contribution of $20 to the fund today or in the future. Please give your contributions to our co-chairs, Mr. Scott Taylor and Pete Aguilar, the lucky ones who qualify for that assignment. 20 bucks, please. Uh, and this is an opportunity to recognize Mr. Molnar, wishing you a very happy birthday. You're here. You, you got away with murder. <laughs> I'd li like to now recognize uh, the full committee ranking member, Mrs. Lowy, for any uh, ge uh, general opening remarks you may have. Ms. Lowy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to thank the chairman and join him in welcoming all of the members to our first markup of the year. I have the utmost respect for our chairman and all the members of this committee. I would argue that the two most significant bipartisan laws enacted this Congress were the 2017 and 2018 omnibuses, which were the product of our committee's efforts. Democrats and Republicans showed compromise. Neither side got all they wanted, but it met the needs of both parties. More importantly, it was good for the American people. When we work together, we can accomplish a great deal. That is why it is so puzzling that today we aren't debating 302B allocations. We have a top line number, we know the split between defense and non-defense accounts, yet instead of allowing the committee and the public to see how they plan to divvy funds among subcommittees, Republicans are keeping us in the dark and asking us to vote on individual bills. This is a troubling sign, particularly when President Trump and OMB Director Mulvaney are working with the House Majority Leader on a rescissions package that will reportedly undo valuable work of this committee from prior years with the, quote, biggest rescission ever proposed. Additionally, not only did Congress not complete action on a budget resolution by April 15th of this year, but the House Budget Committee hasn't even scheduled a markup. Well, I believe my good friend who chairs the Budget Committee will stick to the law 
and not attempt to change discretionary budget authority, regular order would dictate that we need a budget blueprint and a full slate of allocations. This doesn't provide Democrats with any assurances that House Republicans won't once again stack the deck against hard-working American families by slashing funds for the bill that funds Head Start, NIH, job training, labor HHS education bill, which also helps many veterans beyond the assistance provided in the bill we consider today. The American people get a raw deal when budgetary decisions are unnecessarily made in the dark, with no budget, no transparency, it's really unfortunate that the majority won't even allow a vote on subcommittee allocations. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to getting well, to Thank you, Ms. Lowy, for your comments. Uh, we'll now consider the uh, fiscal year 2019 Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Appropriations Bill. Before I recognize uh, Subcommittee Dent to present the bill, I'd like to make a few comments about him. He'll soon be retiring from Congress, as many of you know. Charlie has ably and conscientiously served the House and the people of Pennsylvania's 15th Congressional District for more than 13 years. He's always been a team player, committed to providing product predictability, and from time to time giving us a reality check about the appropriations process. And he's worked across the aisle, I think many of you can agree, to complete uh, all the bills that he's been involved in. And this very special one is a, extremely important for, for him. I know I, I share on all of our behalf how grateful all of, we are, all of us are for your hard work, Charlie, on this important will. Uh, will and we wish you Godspeed in, in, in your future endeavors. And, and thank you. Please give him a round of applause. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Henry, for noticing the haircut. Yeah, I got a little, it's a little short. But uh, I, I just want to thank you all, Chairman Friedlingheisen, uh, uh, for the opportunity to bring this bill before the full committee uh, this morning. The, the, it's the first and, might I suggest, the most important and the greatest appropriations bill of the year. Uh, I want to thank you all uh, for this opportunity. and. Um, uh, all I can really say is that uh, this Milcon VA related agencies bill provides uh, generously uh, for our service members, our veterans, uh, their families, uh, and our monuments and our cemeteries. Uh, Chair Chairman Friedlingheisen and Mrs. Lowy have uh, provided uh, strong uh, leadership and support for this bill. I certainly appreciate uh, the full committee chair and the ranking member's leadership and, and the participation of all the members of the subcommittee, especially our ranking member and my friend Debbie Wasserman Scholes, who, as you know, brings a great deal of energy and determination to her role, and I appreciate her partnership and friendship uh, over the years, and particularly now uh, as we deal with this bill. Uh, I'd also like to thank our committee staff on both sides of the aisle, uh, Sue, Matt, Sarah, uh, Kia, and Tracy, as uh, well as my uh, personal office uh, staffer, Caitlin Wilson, who's out here. I want to thank all the staff. They do a terrific job uh, for all of us, as does the entire committee staff, so uh, thanks to them. Give them a round of applause. They make us look good. Thank you. I don't want to be maudlin, but I, I can't uh, let my last appearance as subcommittee chairman pass without saying uh, how much of a pleasure it, it has been for me and, and meant to me to work uh, with my colleagues here. In, in the midst of the confusion and paralysis, uh, people on the committee continue to get the job done. We're the one committee, I've always said, we're the one committee that has to actually do something every year. You know, we have to fund the government, no matter who's the president, no matter who's in charge of the House or the Senate. We've got to get the job done, and, and we always managed to do that. I, I think that the you know, left uh, to our own devices, uh, you know, shutdowns, omnibus bills, and long-term CRs would be distant memories. So I just wanted to say to all of you, thank you for having me on the team. Uh, really proud to, to serve with you. And, um, you know, it, it's too bad that uh, some of our colleagues don't always appreciate the, the work we do here. And sometimes I think they find it a little bit annoying and are a bit dismissive of our function. Uh, but what we do here is is, is primary to our responsibilities to, as members of Congress, and I would argue perhaps the most important thing that we do after <coughs> our power to declare war, you know, funding uh, the government, our power of the purse authorities, 
are, are, are enormously important, and, uh, and I think they have to be taken a bit more seriously by some of our colleagues who are not on this committee. So thank you again uh, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, the con uh, continuing the Appropriations Committee long tradition of uh, transparency and consultation as we've assembled this year's bill, we made an effort uh, to incorporate 1,300 member requests uh, from both sides of the aisle. And so that's, uh, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of requests. So thank you all for your input. And so now for the numbers. Uh, the bill contains $96.9 billion in budget authority, an increase of $4.2 billion over last year's level. Uh, the funding recommendation includes $11.3 billion for military construction, uh, which is uh, 400 and, uh, 412 million, or 3.8 percent, uh, over the. Uh, it's an increase over the fiscal year 18 level. This funding recommendation reinforces the priorities of the pre president's uh, budget request. The bill includes uh, 10.3 billion in base funding, and 921 uh, million in overseas contingency operations funding, or OCO. Uh, the the level is uh, 131 million dollars uh, below the president's request. There's 85.3 billion dollars for the Department of VA. Uh, which is an increase of nearly $4 billion, or 4.8% or over the FY18 level, and, as, and that's at the same level as the budget request. Of the $85.3 billion provided for VA, $71.2 billion is for medical care uh, for 7 million veterans. Uh, we make important investments in many VA programs, including mental health treatment and suicide prevention, research, uh, and claims processing at or above the budget request. Uh, Two billion is provided as the uh, second year of the, of the budget deal commitment for infrastructure funding uh, for VA facilities. $317 million is for related agencies on our bill. Uh, the American Battle Monuments Commission, ABMC, uh, Arlington National Cemetery, uh, the Armed Forces Retirement Home, and the Court of Appeals uh, for Veterans Claims. Uh, we were able to reallocate funds to provide $74 million uh, for the Arlington Cemetery Southern Expansion uh, to guarantee burial space uh, through 2050 at, uh, at Arlington. Uh, this bill supports our troops uh, with the facilities and services necessary to maintain readiness and morale at bases here in, here in the states and across the world. It is extremely important that we get our infrastructure in, in shape uh, to support the force we have now as well as the force we want to grow in the future. And the bill funds our veterans' health care systems to ensure that our promise to care for those who have sacrificed in defense of this nation is met as, uh, as, as those men and women return home. Uh, we owe this to our veterans and are committed to sustain oversight so that programs uh, deliver what they promise and taxpayers are well served by the investments we make. Uh, I urge you to support this bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Uh, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Chairman, as I said at our subcommittee markup, Mr. Dent has uh, set a very collegial and cooperative tone, as he always does, and I want to thank him for being so inclusive as we worked through this process. However, I, too, regret to say that I'm disappointed that this collaboration has not extended to the full committee process, as we have yet to see 302B allocations for any other bills, and the Milcon VA Bill 302B remains just a partial estimate. We have a two-year budget agreement. We know the top-line numbers. It is fiscally irresponsible and leaves the public in the dark for us not to be debating and given the opportunity to debate each of the 302B allocations for each appropriations bill. It is outside the, the normal process, outside of regular order, for us to be de debating and marking up an appropriations bill without knowing what the allocation is for that bill. And we clearly do, and the majority clearly does know the allocation. So. Um, it's, it's just disappointing that, uh, that, that in this committee, which is not part of our tradition, that we've had such a lack of transparency. But again, on a more positive note, Chairman Dent has worked very hard with an extremely limited amount of time to get us to this point. Even with this short time period, this bill addresses many members' concerns, as well as critical issues impacting our veterans and active and, and reserve service members. The Milcon portion of the bill is up by $241 million over last year's enacted level. In my opinion, the FY19 request adequately provides funding for both the active and reserve components. I was also pleased to see that for the base realignment and closure, the BRAC account, the bill provides $54 million above the FY2019 budget request, which will help expedite the cleanup of former Defense Department sites, which is an important goal. One item I want to point out is the new fund for enhancing security and safety. The bill includes $150 million for enhancing force protection and safety at military installations. 
Too often, access control points, air traffic control towers, fire stations, and anti-terrorism force protections deficiencies compete with the big ticket items and never make it into the request. These additional funds should help the Defense Department address important security and safety shortfalls. For the Department of Veterans Affairs, Title II is $3.9 billion above FY18 enacted for a 5% increase over the FY18 enacted level. The mark also fully funds the FY18 second bite of the apple, $500 million, which brings the total amount provided for VA medical care to $71.2 billion, a 2% increase over FY18 enacted. Mr. Chairman, I'm also pleased that the bill rejects the administration's proposal to combine the medical services and community care accounts into one enormous account. Maintaining the old structure of two accounts offers the most transparency for the committee to both monitor and control spending in these two areas and make sure we don't take really inappropriate steps towards privatization of health care at the VA. Specifically for health care, the bill includes $196 million for suicide prevention, an important priority for all of us, with over 20 veterans tragically taking their own lives each day. This is critical funding. The VA portion of this bill also provides $732 million, $10 million above the enacted level for medical research, which will fund essential efforts such as those to address TBI and PTSD, develop state-of-the-art prosthetics, care for victims of military sexual trauma, and treat veterans suffering from mental illness. The bill also continues to fund important programs to combat veterans' homelessness, provide all of our veterans with effective and timely health care, and improve the veterans' benefits application and appeals process. I'm also extremely grateful for the Chairman's support for in vitro fertilization and coverage for assisted reproductive technologies for veterans who have sustained a service-connected injury that impacts their fertility. This issue is personally very important to me, and to so many service members, all veterans deserve to be able to start families. Moreover, providing access to IVF is consistent with the VA's goal to support veterans and improve their quality of life. The bill before us today continues the same bipartisan approach from the FY 2018 bill. This bill continues to address the issue of breast cancer awareness and prevention as well. We need to make sure that women veterans have the same access to health care as women in the private sector. The bill also honors the budget deal and includes $2 billion for infrastructure improvements allocated between $750 million for seismic corrections, $800 million for non-recurring maintenance, $350 million for minor construction, and $100 million for cemetery major construction. Between the regular account and the initiative, it includes $1.2 billion for seismic corrections. This funding is vital to helping the VA address its infrastructure issues. One last item funding-wise is the increase in funding for Arlington National Cemetery. The bill is $74 million over the budget request so we can continue the southern expansion. The chairman was also able to do this by shifting money that was requested for the unnecessary courthouse for the Court of Appeals and shifting this money to Arlington. The expansion is vital to increasing the life of the cemetery by 30 years. As you can see, this bill does a lot of things that we all support, and while I believe this is a good allocation for the FY 2018 Milcon VA bill, there is one item that I am particularly concerned about. The bill includes $69 million for a high-value detention facility at Guantanamo Bay Naval Station. Mr. Chairman, there are 40 detainees at Gitmo, 40. This works out to a cost of more than $1.7 million per detainee. Keep in mind as well that costs for the entire facility, including the Joint Task Force, over the last three years have averaged $21.3 million per year. And this average includes a spike of $27.5 million for a major repair in 2016. The total funding included for this unnecessary project could sustain the entire base for three years. This is a huge waste of resources, especially when balanced against the needs of our own military service members. And so I strongly oppose the inclusion of this wasteful and irresponsible project. It is for this re these reasons that I will offer an amendment to strike it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we should not be building a Taj Mahal for terrorists. When each of us has spent a lot of time at military bases around the world and seen the aging infrastructure needs that our fi war fighters deal with every single day. I've seen rusting uh, airplane hangars. Uh, I've seen uh, corroded barracks. We have substandard conditions in too many places, yet we are going to spend $69 million to house 40 detainees at Gitmo, which should be closed anyway. But if we're not closing it, we certainly shouldn't be prioritizing a facility that's going to house 40 people, spend $1.7 million a person on it, and it won't even be done for five years. That's not prioritizing our warfighters, in my estimation. Mr. Chairman, these markups represent the first step in a long process 
Democrats stand ready to work with you to address these issues as we move forward in the appropriations process. I want to thank the staff for all of their hard work as well, from the committee to Sue Quantius, Sarah Young, Kia Batman Glitch, Tracy Russell, and Caitlin Willis Wilson, and from my personal office, Caitlin Lane, and from Mr. Dent's personal office uh, as well. Um, I heard Caitlin is a Patriots fan, and for that, I am sorry. Um, <laughs> and now turning to my second issue with this bill, which is the depart departure of my 2004 classmate. To say that Charlie Dent is a class act does not properly convey how I feel about him. Charlie Dent is a statesman and a steady, reliable, and strong vo voice for his constituents, a badly needed voice of reason during difficult times. But most of all, Charlie, I've been proud to call you a friend all of these years. I will miss your delusions about Penn State being a great sports program. As we all know, the Florida Gators are the sports program all others must measure themselves against. And I will also really miss your love for all Philadelphia sports teams, although I'm not sure why. And on a serious note, I want to wish you, my friend, all the best. We cannot wait to watch you continue to rise. Uh, this process will be a poorer one with your absence. Thank you so much. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, uh, Debbie, uh, for your comments. And I, I, may I associate myself with many of your comments uh, about Charlie. He's been kicking New Jersey in the teeth for years. <laughs> but, greater Pennsylvania. Yeah, greater Pennsylvania. Uh, America starts here, as we say. Uh, th thank you uh, both uh, for your comments and obviously your close working relationship to ensure that our troops, our families, and veterans are well cared for. There's no argument there. I'm pleased that once again we're kicking off the markup session with the Milcon, uh, uh, Milcon VA bill because it is obviously our most important responsibility as members of Congress to provide for the common defense as well as to provide for the men and women who serve and have served our nation in uniform. This is a particularly crucial time for both our armed forces and the Veterans Administration. As we're rebuilding our military, we need to address many significant issues that also are plaguing the Veterans Administration and preventing our veterans and our servicemen and women from getting the best care possible. This bill contains a total increase of $4.2 billion above current levels, building on the significant investments we made in the recent passage of the Omni. This includes $11.3 billion for military construction projects, a 3.8 percent increase above fiscal year 2018 levels. This funding will enable our military to fight current and emerging threats around the globe from many locations, domestic as well as foreign, as well as sustain the quality of life programs that our servicemen and women and their families rely on, including housing, medical, mental health, and educational facilities. This bill also includes $85.3 billion for the Department of Veterans Affairs, an increase of $3.9 billion above current levels. These additional funds are directed to critical priorities, improved access to health care, quicker claims processing, a huge issue for many, uh, many of our constituents, and support for crucial programs, as I've mentioned, suicide prevention, mental health, and opioid uh, abuse as well. This uh, proposal also includes $1.3 billion for the new VA electronic uh, health records program to expedite this long-awaited project, which is aimed at merging the Department of Defense system with the VA. I, I know that Ms. Lowy and many of us here share a frustration about the money that we spent on both of these systems and the fact that today we are still far from the merge and seamlessness that uh, we anticipated actually two or three years ago. But I, it's a shared frustration. I won't see it to its conclusion, but we continue to make that investment. This legislation al also strengthens oversight and accountability at both the VA and the Pentagon. Millions of veterans rely on the VA system, and we need to ensure that they're getting the treatment they deserve without wasting precious taxpayers' dollars. This includes rigorous reporting requirements that Charlie's put in the bill, and greater protection for whistleblowers. Again, I want to thank Chairman Dent, Ranking Member Wasserman Schultz, and the subcommittee for producing a bill that fulfills our duties to those who serve and fight for freedom. They deserve the peace of mind during and after they leave active service. And I urge my colleagues to support this legislation. And I'm pleased to recognize my ranking, Ms. Lowy, for any comments she may have. Thank you. 
Chairman Dent, Ranking Member Wasserman Schultz, Chairman Freelingheisen, for your work on this bill. As we consider the first bill of the year, I really am frustrated that once again, the majority is departing from what had been long-standing committee practice of examining allocations for each subcommittee. Democrats are focused on investments to create jobs, grow the economy, help hardworking American families, and provide for our security. When Republicans fail to govern responsibly and keep us in the dark on a complete set of allocations, we cannot adequately judge how our priorities may fare on this bill and how it fits into the larger picture. And my friends, it certainly is not regular order. Turning to the Milcon VA bill, I first want to recognize the tremendous debt of gratitude we owe to those who have sacrificed for us in our armed forces as well as their family members who share in the service to our country. That is why our work is so important to ensure our veterans receive the honors, benefits, and assistance that they have earned. The fiscal year 2019 bill for military construction and veterans affairs would provide 96.9 billion a $4 billion increase over the fiscal year 2018 enacted level. There are many essential components of this bill, including $2.9 billion for the Veterans Benefits Administration, $1.8 billion to address veterans' homelessness, $511 million to support the health needs of women veterans, and the second installment of $2 billion for veterans' infrastructure improvement as part of the spending agreement reached in March. I take a deep breath, Mr. Chairman, because I have long advocated dozens of meetings for DOD and the VA to use the same electronic health record systems which would coordinate care for veterans once they leave the service. While former VA Secretary David Shulkin put VA on that path, the contract remains unsigned. It is my hope, my friends, that the resources and oversight in this bill will ensure that the project moves quickly, 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 probably five, six years, so I hope at this point it can move quickly so the federal government can more efficiently meet the health needs of our veterans. Mr. Chairman, I'm saying this calmly, but after dozens of meetings, both public meetings, private meetings, it's an embarrassment that we can't get this job done, and I just want that on the record. And I hope those who are responsible at the Defense Department and the VA get their act together and do it now. Lastly, it is unconscionable that a veteran who has the courage to seek treatment for substance abuse should be turned away for weeks because of limited capacity at the VA. I do thank the chairman for including report language that I requested to urge the VA to reduce wait times for access to inpatient substance abuse treatment. But Mr. Chairman, as many of our colleagues, I know it's our responsibility to put language in, but I am just fed up that our veterans can't get the care that they deserve and that they have to wait so I am sending a strong signal that in addition to language in the bill, we're going to be following up because this is outrageous. Mr. Chairman, while I appreciate the work on this bill, our work is done without knowing how it will strategically mess, mesh with all the other spending bills. So we can't be sure 
that we are truly doing all we can to help not only veterans, but all Americans. I urge the chairman to raise this with the leadership, work with Democrats to return to how things should be done. And before I conclude, this will be the last committee mark with Mr. Dent, my friend as chairman. I wish you good luck. I thank you for your work and service. And I frankly look forward to working together to improve this bill as the process moves forward. And we look forward, Mr. Dent, in continuing to interact and benefiting from your wisdom. Good luck to you and thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Lowy. Any further discussion on the bill? Uh, hearing none or seeing none, Mr. Dent is recognized. I believe he has a manager's amendment. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. An amendment offered by Mr. Dent. I move to dispose of the reading. You all right, uh, Ms. Wasserman Schultz? We support the amendment. Okay, I'll just, I'll just quickly state, by, by the way, I, I, I want to express my apologies to the chairman for needling New Jersey. I just wanted to say that my, both my paternal grandparents were born and raised in New Jersey. My mother-in-law is from Phillipsburg, New Jersey. We love the place, but Pennsylvania will always be a lesser place. I want you to know, ever since we removed the billboards when you cross the Delaware River, those billboards always said, America starts here. Just a shot at New Jersey, but, <laughs> but we took them down because uh, we didn't want to offend you. Uh, but uh, so I do have an amendment at the desk. It's the manager's amendment, uh, which consists of uh, one non-controversial bill language item and report language items that have been agreed to by both sides of the aisle. Uh, there's one bill language change and 14 pieces of report language. I think we've been able to accommodate the changes that uh, members of the committee have requested. Uh, there is one item I would note uh, within the package there is bill language that prohibits uh, obligation of the $69 million provided uh, for a new high-value detention facility at Guantanamo, at Guantanamo uh, pending a corresponding authorization in fiscal year uh, 2019. I hope this will address the concerns that some members have about the facility. Uh, by now, I believe you've uh, had a chance to look through that, that package at your desk. I move that the amendment be adopted. Thank you, Mr. Dent. Ms. Wasserman Schultz is right I there. jumped the gun. I'd still support the amendment. <laughs> <laughs> you don't support his other remarks. I do appreciate the fencing of the, uh, of the funds on the Guantanamo Bay facility pending the authorization of the, of the authorizing committee, um, but my remarks still stand. Great. A question is on the, yes, Mr. Yes, Rupert's like comment before, before we start. First, uh, Charlie and Chairman Dent, uh, thank you for your leadership. Uh, you've always been open. Uh, you, you really have played, and, and your philosophy has been USA first when it comes to your role as chairman of this committee. So we're going to miss you. We're, a lot of good people are leaving, and you're one of them. So we appreciate it. I do want to thank you and, and uh, Debbie Wasserman Schiltz uh, uh, for your efforts to address the infrastructure issue in national security. Uh, as an example, uh, my, in my district, I have Fort Meade, and it's currently now the second largest installation, uh, Army installation in the country, and it is growing. And um, it is also the, the largest, NSA is the largest employer in the state of Maryland. Uh, and the traffic in that area is horrendous. And it's getting worse and worse. And when I contacted you and, and your team and Debbie, I mean, and you looked at the issue and you addressed it. And I just want to thank you for addressing these issues. And we need to address these issues throughout the country. So thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bishop. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as a former ranking member of uh, this uh, subcommittee. Uh, once again, I'm proud uh, that the committee sets aside partisan issues to come together to meet the needs of our military, uh, our veterans, and their families. I want to thank Chairman Dent uh, and ranking member Wasserman Schultz uh, for their hard work on this appropriations bill. And I'd like to acknowledge Chairman Dent's uh, service to the committee in light of this being his last markup. Uh, your service and your friendship are greatly appreciated, and uh, we'll miss you. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Ms. Lloyd, the ranking member, uh, for your leadership also. Uh, this bill makes great strides to ensure that appropriate funding uh, is there to enhance the readiness of our military, as well as provide funding for VA uh, to take care of our veterans. Uh, it also strengthens the oversight and the accountability uh, for both DOD and the Veterans Administration. However, uh, of the many things that the bill does accomplish uh, for our service members, veterans, and their families, 
I still find it troubling how we continue to operate through irregular order. Uh, today we're marking up two appropriations bills in the absence of a budget and agreed upon discretionary spending levels. Uh, continuing to mark up appropriations bills without a sense of the whole uh, is careless and reckless. Uh, although the bill does a great deal for our military and for our veterans, uh, we owe it to the American people to operate through regular order. With that said, I yield back the remainder of my Thank you, time. Mr. Thank Bishop. You Ms. Lee is uh, recognized, and then... Thanks, thanks very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Let me um, first thank yourself and our ranking member, also uh, Chairman Dent and our ranking member on the subcommittee, for uh, your tremendous leadership in making sure that um, this continues to be a bipartisan um, committee um, markup and report. Also to Chairman Den, I just have to say, since it's your last subcommittee uh, markup, I really uh, have enjoyed working on the subcommittee. Uh, you've been very, very uh, forthright in how you have addressed all of our issues, and I spe especially want to thank you for your deep understanding and concern for minority veterans. Uh, you're going to be missed but I hope to see you as you move into this next chapter of your life. Let me just um, mention a couple of things. First of all, of course, all of you know that I'm the daughter of a veteran, uh, 25 years retired Lieutenant Colonel, my uh, late dad Garvin, Lieutenant Colonel Garvin Tut. And I've had the privilege, really, to work with the VA and the military all of my life, quite frankly. And so uh, I'm extremely concerned and committed to making sure that we keep our commitment to our nation's veterans and their families. And so by providing robust resources to ensure the quality and in innovative treatments, especially to help uh, veterans' mental health needs, and also to ensure the VA meets the needs of our changing veterans' population is extremely important to me, and I know the system fairly well, so I know this bill is really going to help. First of all, let me just mention a couple of things with regard to my district. One is uh, I'm thankful that we're going to uh, request quarterly updates on projects that are jointly managed by the Army Corps of Engineers. While the committee has strongly endorsed the management of large VA construction projects by the Corps, the transition oftentimes has caused uh, some delays in construction schedules. In my own district, for example, the construction of a VA outpatient clinic at what we call Alameda Point is unfortunately de delayed, which means that veterans in and around the East Bay would not have access to this clinic for many years, and it just did not need to be this way. So I'm glad that we're including language that will allow the committee to mitigate against further uh, avoidable delays and ensure that we can meet the needs of our veteran population. Also, I'm pleased to see that we have $8.6 billion for mental health services, which is $6 million above the President's budget request. This increase will help ensure that the Veterans Administration can provide critical mental health care for veterans diagnosed with illnesses like PTSD, uh, of course, anxiety, and, and depression. In this bill, also, we have the language to provide the committee with the report on whether veterans of color receive quality and culturally appropriate care. And I know the chairman knows I've experienced many issues around this with, with my veterans and at many veterans outpatient clinics also. Many uh, minority veterans are diagnosed with PTSD uh, just in general at higher rates than white veterans. And so we need to know why, what's taking place, and have a plan to move forward. Also, I'm glad that we're prioritizing investments in research on the real efficacy of cannabis use among the veteran population to treat conditions such as chronic pain, and PTSD. So this important research is critical to really relieving the suffering and pain of many of our veterans. Finally, let me uh, just say thank you for this uh, provision to require the VA to update its 2015 analysis of the poverty trends in veterans' populations. This is really um, incredibly important information as VA analysis from 2015 indicated that poverty rates among veterans were on the rise. Um, this is just quite frankly unacceptable. And so thank you again for these provisions, but also I just have to associate myself with the comments that have already been made about the 302 uh, allocations. We need to know what the spending levels are in an open process. Um, I'm serving on Labor Age Committee, and we need to make sure that all of our domestic and veterans' needs are taken care of. And so we need to address these overall levels 
in the committee with, without delay. So thank you again. And I thank you, Ms. Lee. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Chairman Dent. It's been great serving alongside you. Appreciate your service and wish you the best in your next chapter. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I rise to thank you and staff and my peers for including language in the bill that allows the military to pay a share of the cost of public highway improvements that are necessary to mitigate unusual impacts of defense activity, to provide resiliency, and reduce risks from things like sea level rise and recurrent flooding which create vulnerabilities to military installations, such as the world's largest naval base in Norfolk, Virginia. So I want to thank you and everyone else for helping DOD develop a posture to deal with this reality. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any further discussion? Ms. Captor is recognized. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, I just wanted to stand and uh, say to Chairman Den, thank you so very much for your service to the country uh, on many levels, including this committee. It's been really uh, rewarding to work with you and uh, you have served very honorably and uh, we wish we all wish you just the very best in in your future years you will be missed here I hope you join the former members organization and that we'll see you often uh, I have a question of the majority and while you're thinking of the answer I wanted to say a word about the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs uh, because I think the reports are pretty good uh, my question really is, I, I honestly don't understand why we didn't vote on the 302B allocations as the first order of business this morning. That is really unusual, and it is not our normal uh, process here. You obviously have a budget number. I don't understand why this bill is being uh, debated in the way that it is. Uh, as one of 12 without us understanding the total. So while you're thinking of the answer to that question, which we would all appreciate for the record, uh, I just wanted to say in terms of people who've served on Veterans Affairs and AMILCON in the past, uh, honestly, we're making progress as a country. Uh, we now have been able to house over half of our homeless veterans. The number's going down. We've been at war for 16 years. And uh, the pressure on the VA has been enormous. Um, but uh, RAND Corporation just came out with a study showing that care in a veterans facility overall is equal to or better than that in the other uh, parts of hospitals in our country. That is really a feather in the cap of the VA and all those who work so very hard uh, to help our veterans as they come home. I want to um, also mention that uh, the funding for the uh, PTSD center, I hate to use the word disorder, I like post-traumatic stress. It's more descriptive of what's really going on in the human brain, uh, which is more than double the president's request is extraordinarily important. But I want my colleagues to know whether it's opioids or whether uh, it is homelessness, uh, whether it is PTS, that our country lacks over 100,000 doctors to treat these conditions. So whatever subcommittee you're on, if you can do anything to help fund the education and draw people into these extremely important professions in the behavioral and neuropsychiatric sciences. We aren't meeting the mark there for the country. It's beyond any one subcommittee, but it is a very important question. If you go to most of your facilities as you do, you will find there are almost no advanced practice nurses or behavioral specialists to deal with these individuals. It is a massive national crisis including on the physician side as well as on the nursing side. So I just wanted to mention that for the committee. I think I've given the chair of the full committee and, and uh, our dear Republican colleagues on the other side time to answer my question, why did we not vote on 302B allocations as our first order of business this morning? Thank you, Ms. Kaptur. Uh, I think it's fair to say that over the last four or five years, uh, we've often voted uh, our first bills on notional numbers, so we're continuing to work on uh, 302B allocation to take a look at those numbers, and we'll continue to do that and, and consult with you before we finish the process. Mr. Young, it's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, our veterans, as we know, sometimes carry some real emotional war wounds with them. and. We learned about five years ago that the GAO did a study about the Veterans Crisis Line and some of the, the problems that we had with that. But we decided to fix that, and we, call, we passed a No Veterans Crisis Line call should go, go on an Answered Act a few years ago, and then a Study Act a few years ago as well, 
And uh, I just want to thank you for the language in the bill to make sure that uh, we are working with the VA because we're all in partnership here to take care of our veterans and the continued oversight to make sure that that, uh, that call line goes answered. So thank you for that. Further discussion on the manager's amendment. Mr. Serrano is recognized. I'll be very brief, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank the leadership of the subcommittee and the committee itself putting this bill together. It goes a long way to deal with a lot of issues. And we speak a lot about veterans. And these are the committees where we can really do something. And as Mr. Dent rightfully said, if left to ourselves, we could get these bills out in time and we could get the government running all the time. But outside the issues come to play. Let's hope that doesn't happen this year. And let me close, Charlie. You know, many things can be said about you. Patriotic, many words, uh, uh, supportive of your district, good representative, caring. But the nicest thing I think we could say is what I'm going to say. You're just a nice guy. You're a gentleman. You've always treated me with such respect. We, you're, you've never been a Republican, and I've been a Democrat when we talk. We've been two people who care for this country. You've asked me questions about where I come from. I've asked you questions about your district. And if more people did that, we would have a greater nation. And so, although the nation is great already, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't have, let me clear this up. I, I think America is already great. It just needs more people to share in its greatness. How about that? But thank you, Charlie, for your service, and good luck in everything you do in the future. Thank you, Mr. Serrano. Uh, the question is on the manager's amendment. Uh, Mr. Cartwright, Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would be remiss if I did not add my voice to those complimenting Charlie Dent as he leaves. Uh, one wonders. Uh, whether he's leaving right after this markup. I understand there's a, a car with a running engine outside right now. <laughs> and a makeup artist inside. <laughs> 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 Nevertheless, I would like to, uh, I would like to say this. Uh, I, I came to the Congress in uh, January of 2013, um, and uh, I soon picked up a sense that there is a bipartisan strain running through this place. And it was Charlie Dent uh, who brought that home to me. He set the tone when he was the first person I saw walk across the aisle and, and, and uh, talk to us in the Pennsylvania corner <laughs> on the Democratic side and, and talk about some uh, uh, commonly shared Pennsylvania interests. Uh, I remember that, Charlie, and you did help set the tone for me. Um, I, uh, uh, I note with regret uh, that you're leaving. Uh, it seems like too many of the people uh, who share that same strain and that same tone are leaving this, this, this beloved house. Um, I, uh, I, I, I also note regret that, with regret that I will be the only Pennsylvanian on this committee. Uh, so, Charlie, I assure you, if I remain the only Pennsylvanian on this committee, I will take up that banner uh, to stand up for Pennsylvania, uh, to remind everyone about the uh, the rightful and reigning uh, Super Bowl champions, um, the Philadelphia Eagles, um, and, uh, and the greatness of our, our fair commonwealth. Uh, so, Charlie, uh, uh, thank you for all your great service and best of luck in all your future endeavors. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cartwright. Uh, any further discussion on the manager's amendment? If not, Mr. Mr. Chairman, just yes. briefly, I'd like to Mr. Ryan. Uh, add my uh, commentary to Mr. Dent. Uh, he is uh, one of the few members that you can find in the House gym. It's not a pretty sight. I will share with my colleagues. Um, but he, he is committed uh, and, and a great guy. And, and, uh, and that's, and that's, um, and that's more than we could say for many of you sitting in this room. So anyway. Um, <laughs> But Charlie, as has already been said, has, has been a great member, and one of those members, as we deal with this committee, is always willing to sit down and find solutions. And you've been a real model, Charlie, for all of these years, and uh, we want to say thank you to you. 
I also want to highlight in this bill a couple things that have already been stated, but there's a, an initiative that we were able to get some language in this bill around the concept of post-traumatic growth. And this is a new idea that is circulating uh, around some quarters uh, in the veterans movement about reorganizing the way we look at the post-traumatic stress and a lot of the trauma that, that so many vets are dealing with. And I think this post-traumatic growth initiative shifts the mindset. Um, there are some great facilities, one's in Northern Virginia, uh, Boulder Crest is a facility uh, that, is, that is really promoting this and instituting this. And so I wanna thank the chairman for allowing this language in. I hope we can get some money behind this and get some pilot programs out there as we continue to build it. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity and best of luck to you. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Way out. Any further discussion? Uh, the questions on the manager's amendment, all those say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Uh, the ayes have it. In the opinion of the chair, the amendment's agreed to. Ms. Wasserman Schultz is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. And an I amendment. The uh, reading of the amendment be dispensed with. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I stated earlier in my opening remarks, the bill includes $69 million for a high-value detention facility at Guantanamo Bay Naval Station to house 40 detainees. And that works out to a cost of $1.7 million per detainee. I mean, let's zero in on that. $1.7 million per detainee. And that's if all 40 detainees are housed there. So ultimately, that number could be much higher. Just to put it in pers this in perspective, the sustainment costs for the entire facility over the last three years has averaged $21.3 million per year. And that includes a spike of $27.5 million for a major repair in 2016. So it would be less if you took that, that uh, $27.5 million out, which means we are spending, spending colossally more building a new facility than the sustainment costs for the entire existing facility. The total funding included for this unnecessary project could sustain the entire base for three years. Mr. Chairman, this is a colossal waste of resources, especially when balanced against the needs of our own military service members. The amendment I offer today will strike the high-value detention facility and instead move the funds to the enhancing security and safety pr provision. Mr. Chairman, I mentioned that fund in my remar opening remarks. The purpose of the enhancing security and safety provision is to address shortfalls in access control points, air traffic control towers, fire stations, and anti-terrorism force protection deficiencies across the DOD enterprise, and these additional funds will make our facilities safer. There has been concern for years on both sides of the aisle that these types of military construction projects continually fall short of securing funding. Frankly, providing funds for this initiative is a much better use of military construction dollars than building a $69 million retirement home for terrorists. Mr. Chairman, I believe putting the needs and well-being of 40 detainees at Guantanamo Bay above the needs of the people who serve our country does not reflect our nation's priorities. And by the way, the House Armed Services Committee is marking up their bill as we speak, and they are not authorizing this project. Why we would put $69 million into the Milcon bill for a project that the authorizing committee is not authorizing is beyond my comprehension. It's beyond my comprehension why we would still be providing the money for an expensive, fiscally irresponsible Taj Mahal for terrorists when we have decaying facilities that our warfighters work in every day that will only serve as recruiting tools, a recruiting tool for extremist groups. It's a very simple choice between the security and safety of our bases and service members or a multi-million dollar facility for terrorists. I urge all my colleagues to support the amendment, and I yield back. Mr. Dent, thank you, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Um, the underlying bill does, in fact, include $69 million to replace the high-value detention facility uh, at Gitmo in support of the detainee operations. Uh, we did provide language in the bill that uh, fenced this uh, money. In the event there is no authorization, the money would not be appropriated. It's my understanding that the Senate authorizers uh, will be, in fact, authorizing this, and I suspect the House will take it up at some point. If not now, I suspect before this process is complete. Um, this project supports the Joint Task Force Guantanamo Bay's current mission and will replace uh, an aging uh, facility that has been uh, degrading, certainly, over the last eight years or so. Uh, this project is required to provide an adequate maximum security detention facility with legal visitation area, uh, which conforms to our domestic and international legal obligations, and I can assure you that we are heavily scrutinized 
uh, for all the work that we do down there, and uh, we are held to a very high standard. Uh, the, and I can also tell you, too, that uh, I visited that facility last time in 2010, and I truly regret uh, not getting a Codell down there before my time is completed here as subcommittee chair. I hope the next subcommittee chair does take a Codell down to Guantanamo so that you can see uh, this facility, the broader prison, as well as the uh, high-value detention center. Um, what I can tell you, though, we can't say too much about it because it's classified, but uh, uh, there are a limited number of people uh, at that high-value detention center. And what I can also say is that these are the worst of the worst. These are the absolute worst uh, of the terrorists that uh, have been picked up. And I suspect there will be more terrorists picked up uh, and, and, uh, who, and who also will be housed there at some point. But without this replacement facility, uh, the conditions at the current facility will continue to degrade and they will put our service members at risk. Uh, again, I urge uh, a, a no vote on this uh, amendment, and I yield back. Any further discussion on the amendment? Uh, Ms. Lowy is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of this amendment. Seems to me this is a perfect example of misplaced priorities, and I do hope my colleagues will join me in supporting this amendment. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lowy. Mr. Taylor is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I, I'll be brief, and uh, with all due respect to my colleagues, I want to speak against uh, the amendment. I think you know the the notion that this is a recruitment tool is an overblown political statement. If you've been in the fight, if you've been around the fight overseas, you know that as well. It's important that we understand. Under the last administration, a lot, there were a lot of folks who were simply just killed. Well, dead people can't talk, so you shouldn't kill everybody. Nor, and you have to be able to have a place to house them for the military. You have to be able to extract valuable intelligence from some of these folks in order to save American lives. So with all due respect to my colleagues, I think it is, a, it is the wrong thing to do, and I would urge the members to vote against the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Uh, do you wish to close? Just briefly to say that the point of this amendment is to stress that it is not more important to take care of housing in top quality facilities, terrorists who are we are detaining, as opposed to making sure that we house in top quality facilities our war fighters. And that's the choice that the, this amendment provides you. Do you want to provide $69 million to build a facility for terrorists that won't be ready for five years and spend five years dealing with the construction and, and appropriation of funds towards doing that? Or do we want to make sure that we, the safety and security, as this amendment would provide, of our warfighters is prioritized higher than terrorists? I, I think it's a very clear choice, and I urge the member's support of the amendment. Thank you, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. So the question is on the Wasserman Schultz amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. 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 In the in opinion of the chair, the nays have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Are there further amendments? Yes, I have an amendment at the desk. Yes, uh, Ms. Wasserman Schultz is uh, recognized. An amendment offered by Ms. Wasserman. I ask that the amendment be dispensed with. The reading of the amendment be dispensed with. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be dispensing with the amendment in a moment. Uh, <laughs> um, this is Wasserman Schultz, uh, Quayar number two. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to offer this amendment uh, along with the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Quayar. Uh, earlier this year at our installations hearing, Assistant Secretary of Defense Lucian Niemeyer stated the DOD was in the preliminary stages of exploring options to build a border wall along the Goldwater military range, which covers 37 miles of the border. Mr. Chairman, using defense funds for construction would dramatically change how our government has approached border security. This would shift the responsibility of securing the border from DHS, which has long had jurisdiction, to DOD, and would put the department in a position to lead where it has chiefly had a, held a supporting role. Using DOD funding for the construction of border infrastructure would be unprecedented, and the idea of doing so is extremely alarming, knowing that currently 31% of DOD infrastructure is rated as poor or failing. This is yet again another example of misguided priorities and a complete waste of valuable military construction dollars. The amendment that we offer today uh, will prohibit any military construction dollars from being used to build this unnecessary border wall. Furthermore, our amendment would ensure that the administration cannot circumvent Congress to build a wall. Appropriating and authorizing are legislative decisions and must remain so. What we truly need is comprehensive immigration reform that protects our homeland and reflects our American values. 
I know all Democrats stand ready to work with Republicans to achieve that goal, but Democrats will not support the use of taxpayer dollars for an ill-conceived border wall that has more to do with the campaign promise than the security of our homeland. I urge all my colleagues to support my amendment. Thank you, Ms. Wasserman. So, Mr. Dent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. The underlying bill uh, does not include any funds to support the construction of a border wall. Uh, candidly, that's really not something within our subcommittee's jurisdiction. That really belongs to Judge Carter and, and the Homeland Security uh, Committee's uh, uh, jurisdiction. Um, back in 2006, I voted uh, for the Secure Fence Act, uh, which is the underlying authorization uh, to establish operational control of the border, and that provided for 700 miles of vehicular and pedestrian barriers on the southern border. Uh, many of us, some of us in this room on both sides of the aisle, I believe, voted uh, for that legislation. I'll be the first to tell you we do not need a 2,000-mile-long concrete barrier on the southern border. Uh, that's not what anybody's talking about, and uh, nor should we. Um, if this funding uh, is requested and provided in military construction accounts, the funds can only be used uh, to construct a, a, a border wall or barrier on, on DOD property. And we've done some research on this. Uh, the only DOD property that could, could potentially uh, take on some uh, barriers like this would be uh, 32 miles uh, on the Barry Goldwater Range in Arizona. That's the only place where it could happen. And DOD has not requested that we do anything there, although I'm told we do have a threat from scrappers, people who go on the base to steal spent shells. <laughs> That's a, an issue we have there. But there's no request uh, for, for any type of uh, uh, border funding from the administration in this bill. Uh, and uh, as I said, there's no need, there's, there's no request for the Goldwater Range. So that said, um, I would uh, reluctantly ask that we vote against this amendment because it really is uh, not pertinent to this bill. Thank yield back. Uh, gentlewoman's uh, recognized to close if she wishes. Yes, Mr. Cuellar is recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. And um, again, I want to thank uh, Charlie Dent uh, and, uh, and Ms. Wasserman for the work they've done on this bill. I, uh, if I can just take a few seconds, uh, Charlie and I are, are, are uh, classmates. Uh, I've been to your house, I've been to your town, I've been to your district, and you've been to Laredo, we've been to Iraq and a couple other places. And all I have to do is just summarize you this way. You're a first class act, so thank you for your service. I also rise in support of this uh, amendment uh, for several reasons. Um, uh, first of all, we know that a wall is a 14th century solution to a 21st century issue uh, that we're facing. Uh, the second thing is, if you want to stop drugs, uh, look at the port of entries, because according to DEA, most of the drugs coming into the United States come through the ports of entry and not in between. If you want to stop people coming in, keep in mind that over 40 percent of the undocumented persons that we have uh, came in through visa overstates. So there's other uh, ways of addressing that issue. But the other thing is, um, if you look at most of the property that we have, let's say in Texas, uh, most of that property is owned by private line owners. And if you want to see people get excited, tell them that you're going to have big government coming over to, put, uh, to take their land away uh, so they can go ahead and put a wall. And most of the walls are not put uh, on the, uh, on the uh, riverbanks. Or sometimes they have to go up one mile away. So that means if you own your riverbanks, that means they're going to take a mile away from your private property. So this is why uh, we need to consider the private property uh, owners. Finally, the last thing is the Department of Defense has over $116 million in, in, uh, in maintenance backlog. So why are we going to take money away uh, from, uh, uh, from this maintenance account when we're so backlog itself? Now, uh, Mr. Dent, if you're saying there's no plans, then this should be a harmless uh, amendment that uh, nobody should have a problem. If, if there's no intent, then let's put the, uh, the amendment up for a vote itself and, and, and see what we have. And so, again, I ask you to support uh, this uh, amendment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Royal. I'll go back to the balance of my time. Thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, First of all, uh, as was already stated, the anything to do with the border wall is under the jurisdiction of the Subcommittee on Homeland Security. And I just want to point out if, if the only place any of this money could be used or the, the purpose is the 32 miles in Arizona, that sounds a little bit like a undercover earmark maybe. Um, let me just say that 
this whole issue of, of, of the border wall, of course, has started with the president's uh, campaign rhetoric, where he promised, and I quote, to build a great, great wall on our southern border and make Mexico pay for it. The reality is that the president is seeking to use funding this bill to build a wall with funding that comes from US taxpayers, not from Mexico, as the president promised. This amendment would prevent using funding in this bill to build a wall. We have no idea how many miles of border wall the president plans to build, if there are better alternatives along the border, or how much it will ultimately cost. Even if we had a plan, we need time to evaluate whether investments in a border wall are cost effective and, ur and urgent, more of, of urgent than known threats and vulnerabilities and challenges that our country faces that yet have to be met. As members of Congress, protecting our nation and the American public is our greatest responsibility. It is our obligation to act in their best interests and to invest their tax dollars wisely. Without the opportunity to do so, if we allow funding in this bill to be used to build any part of a border wall, we will fail to meet our obligation. And again, in spite of the president's assurances that Mexico will pay for the wall, the fact is the American taxpayer will. And it will be at the expense of real security needs. Unfortunately, the president's border wall is now a proxy for the border immigration debate. And I hope that uh, this committee will vote in favor of uh, Wasserman Schultz's amendment. Thank the gentlewoman. Any further discussion, if not, recognize uh, the amendment sponsored to close. Ms. Wasserman thank, Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just, to, just to close by saying that we've not appropriated funds specifically for the wall in this bill. What this amendment says is that we're not going to allow the administration to circumvent our decision making here as appropriators and as members of Congress by taking money from funds that we have appropriated for safety and security and infrastructure and put it towards building an unnecessary border wall that Congress clearly has not indicated support for and has not moved forward on, on uh, appropriating funds for. So I would urge the members support. Okay, the question, and thank you, the gentlewoman. Uh, questions on the Wasserman Schultz Amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. nay. In the opinion of the chair, the nays have and the amendments not agreed to. Any uh, further amendments? Uh, hearing none. Uh, any uh, uh, gentleman from Alabama is recognized uh, for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to favorably report the Military Construction and Veteran Affairs Preparation Bill for FY19 to the House. The question's on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Uh, in the opinion of the chair, the, uh, the ayes have it, and the motion is, uh, is agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I request you close the vote. The chairman requests uh, there are several people. Would you uh, stand? Eleven. We need a few people to raise their hands to a recorded vote. Recorded re vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt, aye. Mr. Adderholt, aye. Mr. Aguilar, Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade, aye. Mr. Amade, aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Calvert, aye. Mr. Calvert, aye. Mr. Carter, aye. Mr. Carter, aye. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Ms. Clark, yes. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson, aye. Mr. Culberson, aye. Ms. Deloro, aye. Ms. Deloro, aye. Mr. Dent, Mr. Dent, aye. Mr. diaz Ballard, Mr. diaz Ballard, aye. Mr. Fleischman, Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fortenberry, Mr. Fortenberry, yes. Mr. Freelingheisen, aye. Mr. Freelingheisen, aye. Ms. Granger, Ms. Granger, aye. Mr. Graves, Mr. Graves, aye. Do Dr. Harris, Dr. Harris, aye. Ms. Herrera Butler, Ms. Herrera Butler, yes. Mr. Jenkins, Mr. Joyce, Mr. Joyce, yes. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor, aye. Mr. Kilmer, aye. Mr. Kilmer, aye. Ms. Lee, aye. Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCullum, aye. Ms. McCullum, aye. Ms. Meng, aye. Ms. Meng, aye. Mr. Molinar, aye. 
Mr. Molinar, aye. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, aye. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, aye. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby. Mrs. Roby, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rooney. Mr. Rooney, aye. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard, aye. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger, aye. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan, aye. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, aye. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, aye. Mr. Valadeo. Mr. Valadeo, aye. Mr. Visglosky. Mr. Visglosky. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, yes. Mr. Yoder. Mr. Yoder, aye. Mr. Young. Mr. Young, aye. Are there any members who wish to record their votes or change their vote? A clerk will tally. That other sheet we have there. Okay. <laughs> uh, on this vote, the the ayes are forty seven, and the, and there are no nays. The amendment is agreed to. Uh, I ask uh, uh, the bill is agreed to. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be given the authority to make technical and conforming uh, change to the items approved today for three days uh, without objection, so ordered. Okay, move into. Okay. Our second and final uh, order of business today as we shift uh, seats here, uh, and Mr. Yoder, thank you, Mr. Dent. Uh, is to consideration of the fiscal year 2019 legislative branch appropriations bill. I now recognize the chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Yoder, to present his bill. If you could. Some amendments are being passed out. Wait about uh, one minute, and then we're going to start. Meeting will come to order. As I said a few minutes ago, the second order of bill is to do the legislative branch appropriations bill. It's my pleasure to recognize the chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Yoder, to present his bill. Please give him your attention. Mr. Yoder. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Uh, morning. morning out there. Uh, I want to I want to thank uh, Chairman Dent for sort of warming up the crowd this morning. So we're now ready for the kind of the main event here. Um, 
I am uh, honored and proud to present the Legislative Branch Appropriations, FY 2019. Meeting will come to order. Please give the uh, chairman uh, the respect uh, and listen to his remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, I'm honored to present the 2019 Legislative Branch Appropriations Act. Uh, we worked hard as a committee in a very bipartisan fashion. I've got an, a, a great uh, ranking member who we work hand in hand to uh, advance many of the members' priorities to protect this institution. Uh, and its various agencies. Uh, and we worked hard towards uh, being responsible with the dollars we've been given, being very conservative with those, uh, th those dollars on behalf of taxpayers, and then really working hard towards transparency, oversight, uh, and security, many of the things we want to see out of our legislative branch uh, employees and, uh, and officers. So this morning, the recommendation for fiscal year 2019 legislative branch appropriations bill provides $3.8 billion. This excludes the Senate items, which historically are left to the Senate to determine. Uh, this is an increase of $132.6 million from the currently enacted levels. The bill and report, as I mentioned, were developed in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, we worked very quickly in the time we were allotted and held more hearings than we held the, had the year before. We are actually able to incorporate 140 member requests into the bill, 123 of which were came from Democratic members. So I think we certainly worked hard to incorporate work from both parties. Uh, we'll start with the House of Representatives, where we all serve, welcomes thousands of visitors each day as we conduct legislative business. The Capitol building is said to host three to five million people each year. Uh, it's a working museum of history and art, and its facilities and support services carry on seamlessly as millions uh, come and go. This is also a place of fiscal discipline. Our bill continues to hold spending within the House at more than 10 percent below the FY 2010 levels. The bill includes $1.23 billion for operations at the House, which is an increase of $32 million. The increased level of funding for the MRA will allow authorized levels as approved by the Committee on House Admin and, of course, increases towards important things like cybersecurity, workplace rights training, the Employee Advocacy Office, and improved customer service. And language in this bill continues the policy of denying pay increases to members of Congress for the 10th consecutive year. Uh, moving on to the Capitol Police, one of the most important components of this bill is the security of the Capitol grounds, especially the visitors, members, and staff. Just a, about a year after the tragic attack on the Republican congressional baseball practice, our House Sergeant at Arms has testified that members have received an unprecedented level of threats over the last year. Since June of 2017, it is known that 260 of 435 members of Congress have actually had to add extra security equipment to district offices. On a day-to-day -day basis here in Washington, the U.S. Capitol Police are responsible for defending the Capitol and all those working and visiting there. They have new directives to, directives to combat potential terrorist threats and are the first line of defense at the events with multiple members of Congress here in D.C. And further, they coordinate with local law enforcement in our districts and provide intel and threat assessment. We provide $456.358 million to the Capitol Police, an increase of $29.8 million over FY18. This funding will provide necessary resources to the Capitol Police to fund officers hired last year and hire additional staff. The Capitol Police force strength is currently 2,363, including civilians and sworn officers, and this budget request accounts for funding for 92 new positions to begin throughout the fiscal year. We'd like to thank the men and women who serve us and keep us safe, and we're grateful for uh, what they do. Uh, the CBO, we provide $50.7 million. The architect of the Capitol, we provide $642 million. And after numerous hearings, briefings, and tours of various facilities, we are uh, investing in a number of capital uh, improvements to the Capitol complex. Uh, $62 million for the restoration and renovation of the Cannon House office building. As you know, um, and many know, phase one is expected for completion at the end of this Congress, approximately November of 2018. Work will continue on the Cannon House office project until November of 2024. 32.7 million for phase four of the Rayburn House office building garage rehabilitation project. 21 million for phase four of the cooling renovation at the Capitol power plant. 8.3 million for barrier life cycle replacement and security kiosk replacement. $3 million, $3 million for new south door security screening facility at the Capitol. $4.7 million for tunnel waterproofing at the Capitol power plant. $5.7 million for partial funding of chiller replacement. And $10 million for the historic building revitalization fund to finance renovations to facilities of the house in future years. This level fulfills the architect of the Capitol's full request for the trust. Moving on to the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress, of course, is a treasured institution, and the American people uh, appreciate its work to preserve 
uh, various uh, copyrighted works and the, the Jefferson uh, um, Library and so many other important things. The bill includes $709.9 million for the Library of Congress, which is $40 million above currently enacted levels, and further greater than $3.8 million over the library's actual request. New funding will go, go towards IT improvements library-wide, as well as specific copyright modernization initiatives. Funds will continue to do the important work to preserve the library's text through a process called mass deacidification, and funding is provided to continue that work at or above current levels. Additionally, funding is provided to hire additional FTEs for the CRS in an effort to increase responsiveness and expanded analytical capacity uh, for a total of 50 new FTEs at copyright and CRS combined. Um, and finally, $20 million is provided towards the Visitor Experience Project at the Thomas Jefferson Building. This is a second installment of three needed to fulfill the top priority project for the library. As my colleagues know, this is a public-private partnership which will receive half of its needed total funding at the end of this fiscal year. It's expected that $20 million will be raised privately and that $10 million in further federal contributions will need to be made in the next fiscal uh, budget. I know this project will be an educational and uplifting experience for Americans and especially for children. We're thrilled to make an investment in this public-private partnership, which the library, again, has marked as their top priority. According to this mark, we expect the library to be able to fulfill their needs for approximately 75 total new FTEs across their programs and fulfill all of their requirements for mandatory cost of living increases for their employees. From 2014 to 2018, we have exceeded the needs of the library to fulfill their COLA by approximately 10%. The GPO, Government Publishing Office, we provide $117 million. The GAO, Government Accountability Office, we provide $579 million. Um, some final member initiatives in crafting this report, we took into consideration the thoughtful feedback from members throughout the committee and the body. Various initiatives are included, which we can all be proud of, which help us serve our constituents and produce efficiencies and transparency in the way Congress operates. And again, we had 140 member requests that we were able to incorporate, 123 of which were from the Democratic side of the aisle. Transparency, we continue our success that we had in the 2018 bill, which we open CRS reports to the public for the first time ever. And we focus our efforts on continued policies to make Congress more open to the public in various ways. Some of these provisions in our bill include creation of a consolidated hearing calendar for both the House and the Senate, digitization of various forms and pieces of data throughout the legislative branch, like a member's bio guide. And I want to commend CRS for their new policy of publishing their report, annual reports online. Uh, lastly, and maybe most importantly, we continue uh, our support for the Wounded Warrior Program. Uh, member requests to expand it, uh, allowing uh, the ability to hire veterans and ex increasing the total slots available to 110, which is more than 22% over the current existing fellowships. In closing, I'd, again, I'd like to thank uh, my uh, colleague from Ohio, uh, Ranking Member Ryan, through his role throughout this process, as well as appreciation to all members of the subcommittee for their participation in the process this year. Our ABLE staff, Jenny and Tim, Adam and Joe, um, I think we've worked very well together. Uh, and I think this is an example of a committee that puts aside partisanship and does what's right for the institution uh, and uh, really uh, works together in so many ways to promote transparency, the security of the Capitol, uh, efficient run of our House of Representatives offices, uh, and I think it's a bill we can be proud of, and I appreciate the, the uh, ranking member's support. And uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Chairman Yoder. Mr. Ryan's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me first uh, thank Chairman Yoder. This has been a, a very busy time for us on the committee, but um, I want to thank you. 103 different uh, Democratic initiatives that made, it, made their way into this bill. I want to thank you for working in such a bipartisan way. Uh, and your staff and our staff have, I think, done a tremendous job. I also want to say uh, thank you for really opening up the committee. We had a number of people come in uh, representing outside groups, uh, bringing us new ideas, just trying to get some new energy and new perspective on some of the work we're doing. So I appreciate you um, taking the lead on that. As you noted, the bill before us contains $3.81 billion, excluding the one point uh, Zero seven billion requested by the Senate. The agencies in the ledge branch bill almost all receive what they requested after taking into account their funding in the 2018 omnibus. With 456 million for the Capitol Police, 18.8 million for the House Sergeant at Arms, we're looking after the security needs of members, staff, and visitors both here in Washington and also in our district offices at home. The bill's $5.4 million for the Office of Compliance and $147.6 million for the House Chief Administrative Officer will support our response to the sexual harassment that has been pervasive since longer than any of us have been members of Congress. 
but has only recently become a national scandal. These uh, dollars will be spent on hopefully preventing uh, these situations from happening in the future. The $642 million for the architect of the Capitol will help continue to reduce our backlog of deferred maintenance. The $579 million for the Government Accountability Office will bring the federal government's premier auditor and watchdog back up to the 3,100 full-time equivalent staff that it needs to root out waste, fraud, and abuse. And if I could just take a second of personal privilege here to say that I know we all have a lot of material to read on different issues. I have found in the past few years the uh, GAO uh, reports extremely valuable in helping us come to some what I think could be um, bipartisan initiatives to root out waste, fraud, and abuse. $50 billion a year in the Medicare program, billions of dollars in the defense program. I, hope, I would hope that those would be issues that we could all agree on, and the GAO provides us some really good strategies on not only what the waste, fraud, and abuse is, but also how to uh, weed it out. And those are some, are some of the worthwhile uses to which we're putting taxpayer dollars in the Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill. Chairman Yoder has put together a fair bill that will help the first branch of government carry out its mission of writing our nation's laws in the coming fiscal year. I'd like to thank him for the time and effort he's put in to assembling this bill. I know it's never easy to be a chairman. I hope I get to find that out at some point in the future. Uh, and of course, I'd like to thank Ranking Member Lowy and Chairman Freelingheisen for their support uh, and leadership. I'm also grateful for the hard work of subcommittee clerk Jenny Pannone and Tim Moynihan from the majority staff, Joe Ianello from Chairman Yoder's office, Adam Berg on the minority staff, and Ann Sokoloff and Ryan Keating from my office. For a second year in a row, they've put in a lot of hard hours uh, and helped Chairman and me get to this point. As strong as this bill is, I can't help but repeat what has been said here a couple of times about the bigger picture. Uh, because we're in almost the exact same position again today. Even a bill like this that is worthy of our support, and I do support it, this bill should be a part of a more coherent budget strategy, and right now it is not. We already know there's a fixed amount of money available to the 12 subcommittees, and instead of laying out the allocation for all 12 subcommittees like we're supposed to do, we're going to start marking up bills and figure out later whether there's still enough money for the ones that come at the end. And we will have to shortchange our response to the opiate epidemic because we gave, uh, or will we have to shortchange our response to the opiate epidemic because we gave some extra uh, to the Copyright Office today? Or are we going to have to cut the EPA because we're spending $21 million uh, on renovating a cooling tower down the street? The answer is we don't know. And we're not unable to make those sort of informed decisions because uh, we haven't seen the plan. And so this, in my opinion, is not how it's supposed to work. It's a dysfunctional approach. Uh, and luckily, the dysfunction uh, today that we're seeing in Congress uh, has not kept the Legislative Branch Subcommittee from doing its job. I support this bill. I thank the Chairman for keeping us focused throughout these tumultuous times. I look forward to discussing a few amendments that we have that will hopefully make it an even better bill, and I yield back the balance of my Thank you, Mr. Ryan, and thank you both for your remarks. Uh, we're grateful, all of us, for your work on the bill and for actually holding nine hearings in a, in a relatively short period of time, just a few weeks. Uh, the People's House, the U.S. Capitol, is a symbol of American freedom. The funding of this bill preserves this institution and protects the hundreds of thousands of people who visit every year. As we know, the bill totals $3.8 billion. It provides and promotes safety and security for all of our visitors, our, all of us, our staffs, and, and, and so many other people. It also includes salary increases for the Capitol Police. They do a remarkable job each and every day to enhance security functions and screening. Funding for the architect of the Capitol address a lot of projects that need attention. Cybersecurity is also prioritized with additional funding directed to IT enhancements. I'm also pleased that the bill continues important funding for the mandatory workplace rights training and the Office of Compliance, uh, Compliance, which has been mentioned. These are important investments. And Chairman Yoder has made it his priority, working with Mr. Ryan, to keep the budget tight, rejecting waste, promoting transparency, and, 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 and working very closely together with his colleague. It also provides, as I mentioned, some good uh, funding for the GAO to ensure that we receive uh, the information, the valuable information they come up with. Uh, I'd like to thank both the uh, chairman and the ranking member 
for your sub uh, for your and your subcommittee for the work, and I obviously urge support of the committee's uh, uh, work. And now, please to recognize Ms. Lowy for any comments she may have. Thank you, uh, Chairman Yoder, Ranking Member Ryan, and Chairman Freelinghuysen for your work on this bill. The FY 2018 omnibus was an important first step in digging many agencies in our legislative branch out of the hole caused by sequestration. This bill continues on that path with a $180 million increase, though it falls $24.9 million below the revised budget request. These investments are critical steps to improve the efficacy of the legislative branch. However, I cannot say that everything in this bill is perfect. For example, aspects of this bill prioritize property over people. The Library of Congress would receive $709.9 million, $3.8 million above the revised request. However, outside of the $20 million for the librarian's worthwhile visitor experience initiative, the library's salaries and expenses would be $6.2 million below the request, which would require the library to absorb employees' mandatory costs of living adjustments. It is irresponsible to force the library to leave positions unfilled and stall workforce investments when we have the ability to fund them adequately. I also wish it invested more in Congress as an institution. When we don't keep pace with the private sector, the executive branch, and frankly, the Senate, we lose or fail to attract talented professionals who are essential to the legislative process, and we strain the House's ability to serve the American people. I hope the majority will work with us on these concerns. And in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say again, it's really unfortunate that we don't have the 302Bs up front so we can make judgments as we move along. I do hope as this process moves along, we're going to have some money for those bills at the end of the line because there are a lot of priorities that we care about and there are no assurances as to what those numbers will be. So I urge you again, Mr. Chairman, to make it clear what the whole process will bring and that the 302Bs are finalized before the end of the process. I hope we could do it as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Lowy. Any further to go? Ms. DeLauro is recognized. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I want to, uh, uh, just if I can f uh, follow up with uh, my colleague, Mrs. Lowy, and my colleague, Mr. Ryan, who made reference to the, uh, to the 302B allocations. Um, it's disappointing that we are really looking at what is viewed as a failed budget process. This is not the regular order that so many talk about here. It's, it, it, to move forward in the fashion that we are moving forward with is, is, is really irresponsible in so many respects. We should not be marking up a bill in this committee until we have a complete picture of what the overall spending plan is, as well as the sub-allocations for all 12 funding bills. That is what regular order uh, is, is all about. That's what past practice has been. Um, are the other bills not as important as Ledge Branch or military construction and veterans affairs? What about homeland security? What about defense? Does the people's bill, of which I have a singular uh, concern about, uh, the labor HHS bill, don't we deserve the same consideration? Uh, I understand putting together a budget is complicated, and, and Mr. Chairman, I understand that, that you operate under political constraints, but we can't solve the problem by avoiding it. So um, I am worried, as I usually am, and I express my view with regard to the Labor HHS um, subcommittee uh, al allocation. Uh, I am concerned that it will be shortchanged, um, and we represent 31% 
of the non-defense discretionary budget. Um, and are we going to once again be shortchanged uh, as we move down this road? Um, if we saw the entire plan being put forward, we may decide that we need to provide additional resources for veterans and military construction. Uh, what was the criteria applied to come up with a number? We may see that the plan would shortchange the other bills, but today no member of this committee can answer the question. Let me um, make reference to another concern that I've had, which is in the, all over the newspapers these days, and that is that the administration is reportedly reviewing a rescission package that would renege on, recent, on the recent bipartisan, and I emphasize bipartisan budget agreement and spending agreement for 2018. Uh, we negotiated that agreement in good faith. Uh, I think that going back on it is a breach of trust, a process, uh, and of good sense, since millions of Americans are benefiting from the vital programs that we all funded. So I think this committee should reject any proposal to violate that deal. Uh, in, in conclusion, look, I just urge the majority, let's put all the cards on the table. Show us the plan for every subcommittee. Uh, and show us how what we are doing for labor, health, and education for every single one of the subcommittees that we are entrusted to do something about. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Laura, any further discussion? Ms. Lee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to also uh, thank both uh, subcommittee chairs for working on this bill together but also associate myself with all the remarks that have been made about our 302 allocations. And really, I, I just have to say, um, we'd all be personally bankrupt if we ran our households like this. And here we're running and making decisions on the federal government without really a full deck. So I would hope that one day we can get back together and make some determinations as to our spending priorities, which of course should put people first. I want to comment on our language in this bill, and I want to thank Mr. Yoder and Mr. Ryan for this, in terms of compensation for our employees, because this report language really will help us better understand how Congress is doing and help identify many of the problems. The compensation study which we required, it will conduct an analysis across race and gender so that Congress may address wage disparities that exist, something we've heard of often anecdotally from outside groups. Now, as a former staffer, and I was one of the first female senior staffers, one of the first African-American senior staffers, now this was, of course, in the day on Capitol Hill, and, here, and, and so I know that this is really long overdue. There are huge, huge gaps between staffers of color and white staffers in terms of wages. And so this is extremely important. I think that we owe it to our staff. Uh, Congress would be really at a standstill if um, we didn't make sure that we adequately compensated all of our staff, regardless uh, of who they are. And so we need to look at this across racial and gender lines. So thank you for including this important study in this manager's amendment. As a former staffer, uh, it's extremely important. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Uh, any further discussion? Not to recognize the, uh, the bill sponsor for a uh, manager's amendment. Mr. Chairman, I have a uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a manager's amendment at the desk. An amendment offered uh, by Mr. Yoder. Considered read. To Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment includes some additional items that we've worked with the, uh, my colleague, Mr. Ryan, uh, Ms. Lee, and others. I want to appreciate their efforts to um, to uh, put this uh, manager's amendment together and to work with the, with the full committee. Uh, healthy food options, energy and sustainability programs, the compensation study that Ms. Lee just spoke of, civic education and transfer authority. Uh, and so in an effort to save tax dollar, taxpayer dollars with the support of Speaker Ryan, we've also included an amendment eliminating the former Speaker's office, which you've been seeing somewhat in the news. And so that's included in this manager's amendment as well. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Yoder. He healthy things in this bill. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Ryan is recognized. We're trying to have some influence here, Mr. Chairman. And just as I was puffing my chest out, someone brought in about five boxes of uh, donuts into the committee hearing room. So I'll try to remain humble and just say that I want to thank the chairman again for uh, incorporating so much uh, of the, the language uh, in here. And I appreciate his leadership and yield back. The question if there have been, yes. The gentlewoman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for. Um, 
the uh, the chairman and the ranking member on the manager's amendment on the second page on study of house salaries and and Ms. Lee just spoke to this and I agree with all of her remarks. Um, I read from this and it says uh, the House of Representatives a report that reviews the salaries and benefits of the personal offices and committee staff in the House of Representatives against the executive branch. Um, to my to my colleagues here, we're losing staff to the U.S. Senate because of what they are paying because of what they have for their personal accounts. Um, they haven't um, um, been as frugal, let me put it kindly. They haven't been as frugal. So I'm wondering um, if, as, as this goes to the floor, if we could also compare ourselves to the, to the U.S. Senate in this, or if there's a reason why the chair uh, feels that the Senate uh, comparison shouldn't be made. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. McCullough. Ms. Lowy, I apologize for not recognizing right. you first. Mr. Chairman, I just want to uh, thank you for working with me to eliminate the office of the former speaker and the manager's amendment. Taxpayers should not be on the hook to fund an office for former speakers. Leader Pelosi herself, a former speaker, requested elimination of this funding, which is unnecessary and better invested elsewhere in this bill. So thank you very much. Uh, any further discussion? If not, uh, the questions on the manager amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. The chair, the ayes have it, and the manager's amendment is agreed to. Further amendments? Uh, Ms. Wasserman Schultz is at the, at the dais. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Have a woman's recognized. I have an amendment at the desk, and I ask that it, the reading of the amendment be dispensed with. Consider it done. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my amendment would increase the Historic Buildings Revitalization Trust Fund account from $10 million to $17 million, which would be a $17 million, $7 million increase equal to the amount we appropriated into the trust fund in the last fiscal year. Um, Mr. Chair, when I became chair of the Legislative Branch Appropriations Subcommittee in 2007, I inherited the Capitol Visitor Center construction project, and I, I would ask that my colleagues who were not here then to listen briefly to the history of that project so you can understand why this amendment is so important. That was a project that, which through several, several Congresses, grew in budget fourfold to nearly $600 million. With the help of my various ranking members through the years, we held hearings every month to hold the former architects of the Capitol accountable to the newly agreed upon schedule and budget. We also brought in GAO to work with committee staff to look at the construction milestones. Frankly, the CVC project was an embarrassment. It was an example of ballooning government projects that were too big to fail and that inevitably pulled resources away from other worthy initiatives. The hope for the trust fund when we created it was that we could bank funds for future large-scale projects like we are experiencing now, Cannon Revitalization, the Rayburn Garage, the coming Longworth and Rayburn Restoration projects, so that we don't ever have a repeat of the CVC again. The original idea was that we would look 10 to 20 years down the road and save appropriately to ensure that this smallest appropriations bill did not have to absorb such large projects at the detriment of other worthwhile programs. For several years, we banked between 30 to $70 million, and then the Cannon Restoration began. I supported the decision three years ago to move over $162 million from the trust fund to a separate Cannon line item, so there was transparency over the restoration of the funds we were spending on that building. Unfortunately, since that transfer, we have not returned to appropriately saving for the future. Cannon has rightly, rightfully received significant funds to continue restoration, but the trust fund has been left with what I believe is an inadequate amount of funding. The architect acknowledged such at the AOC hearing. Clearly, the ar architect has not put any analysis into the $10 million request for the trust fund, and thus there is no correlation between our future costs and the funding requests for the trust fund. When the architect of the Capitol last looked at the potential cost of renovating the Rayburn building, it was a several billion dollar project. With Rayburn already rated, rated as being in poor condition and the problem continuing to get worse and worse over time, how we will pay for its restoration is knocking on our door. Saving rather than spending is hard to do. If we only have $125 million in the trust fund by 2024, as is currently projected, if we keep this spending level consistent, then we'll have to pay for the next house office building renovation and restoration with massive new budget authority in what is the smallest of appropriations bills rather than bank it 
and pay for it from the trust fund. The offset that I would use in this amendment are from the project budgets for chiller replacement and chilled water system expansion in the alternate computer facility and for pipe expansion joint improvements in the capital power plant. Both accounts are near the bottom of the AOC list of priorities and are not more important than us making sure that we can bank this additional money so that over time we aren't damaging our ability to adequately provide for the priorities in this bill. We cannot avoid making hard choices. I'm asking members to look to the future and be fiscally responsible as we have been for many years. That means we have to appropriately save for large scale projects. We cannot stick our heads in the sand, hope for the best, and put a future Congress in the position of having to shortchange the other needs that exist in the legislative branch. As I have said, Mr. Chairman, many times before, this is not a sexy bill. This is not the imp most important issue that we deal with. But being fiscally responsible should be a hallmark of all of our service. Thank you, and I Ms. urge Ms. members Schultz, to uh, Mr. Chairman Yoder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate uh, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, the former chair of the committee, bringing her uh, proposal, her amendment today, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to have to oppose it. Uh, her amendment would cancel two projects uh, that have been uh, recommended by the House architect. One of them is the Capital Power Plant Pipe Expansion Joint Improvements. And the House architect tells us that these uh, existing expansion joints and the high pressure uh, systems are at the end of their service life and safe operation and internal corrosion and erosion exists and if not funded expansion joints and piping will leak and fail causing service interruptions to affected end users and would create dangerous conditions within the tunnel. Uh, and then the other project is a, a partial reduction of the chiller replacement water systems expansion. This is 1970s equipment and deteriorated at the end of its useful life. And essentially, we have a philosophical uh, question for the committee, which is, uh, which is a better use of taxpayer funds? Is it to bank dollars for future projects, or is it to uh, uh, fund these projects today? Uh, Ms. Washerman Soltz does not tell us that these projects aren't ever going to have to be funded. We know they're going to have to be funded at some point, uh, and they're just going to become more expensive. The House Architect estimates that each year we wait on a project, it's going to cost 3% more the next year in labor and in, uh, in uh, uh, expenses. And so I don't know why it would be a good use of taxpayer dollars to postpone these projects for a year or two or three, driving up their cost. Uh, while borrowing money from taxpayers and putting it in a fund, uh, we have deferred maintenance. And that maintenance, as we continue to defer it, will get more expensive. So my uh, recommendation to the committee is to oppose Ms. Wasserman Schultz's amendment. It comes from, a, I think, a very uh, important philosophical point that she's making. And I certainly agree with the value of saving money for the future. But I think postponing these projects actually does a disservice to taxpayers, deferring them further, and would increase the cost of them overall. And so it's just not, to me, wise budgeting. And so I oppose okay. her, her I, amendment. I can't thank the uh, chairman for his comments. Uh, a minute to close to Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the chairman makes my argument for me. <laughs> I mean, we have historic buildings that must be renovated. And the further down the road we push that renovation, the more expensive it's going to be. We're talking about the life, health, and safety of the members that are working, and staff and visitors that are living and working in this, in this institution, and making sure that our larger term much more significant projects have the resources they need, which are going to be much more difficult to fund if we don't bank the money, makes a lot of sense. This is not just philosophical. This is a choice that the majority is making in the allocation, which of course we don't know what that is, but a choice that the majority is making from the allocation that they have received and choosing not to put funds, the adequate funds into this trust fund. That, that's certainly an, a, an option that they have, but it's not a fiscally responsible one, and I urge the members to support my amendment. Thanks, the gentlewoman for her comments. The question is on the Wasserman Schultz Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The chairs, the nays have it. The amendment is not agreed Mr. to. Mr. Chairman, Clerk, I ask for a roll call vote, please. A roll call vote. Clerk will tally. Mr. Adderholt. Yeah. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Yeah. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade. Mr. Aramide, no. Mr. Bishop? Yes. Mr. Bishop, yes. Mr. Calvert? No. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter? No. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright? Aye. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Ms. Clark? Aye. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole? Mr. Cole? No. Mr. Cuellar? Aye. 
Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson? Aye. Mr. Culberson, no. Ms. DeLauro? Aye. Ms. DeLauro, aye. Mr. Dent? No. Mr. Dent, no. Mr. diaz Ballard. No. Mr. diaz Ballard, no. Mr. Fleischman? No. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry? Mr. Fortenberry? Mr. Freelingheisen? No. Mr. Freelingheisen, no. Ms. Granger? No. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves? No. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris? Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Herrera Butler? No. Mr. Herrera Butler, no. Mr. Jenkins? Mr. Joyce? No. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor? Aye. Ms. Captor, aye. Mr. Kilmer? Aye. Mr. Kilmer, aye. Ms. Lee? Aye. Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy? Aye. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCollum? Aye. Ms. McCollum, aye. Ms. Meng? Aye. Ms. Meng, aye. Mr. Molinar? No. Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse? Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, no. Ms. Pingree. Aye. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Aye. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Mr. Quigley. Aye. Mr. Quigley, aye. Ms. Roby. Yes. Ms. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rooney. No. Mr. Rooney, no. Ms. Roybal Allard. Aye. Ms. Roybal Allard, aye. Mr. Rupesberger. Mr. Rupesberger, aye. Mr. Ryan. Aye. Mr. Ryan, aye. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Simpson. No. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, no. Mr. Valadeo. No. Mr. Valadeo, no. Ms. Visklosky. Mr. Visklosky, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no. Mr. Yoder. No. Mr. Yoder, no. Mr. Young. No. Mr. Young, no. Are there members who wish to record their vote or change their vote to? Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry votes no. Any, anyone further? If not, uh, the clerk will tally. Mr. Mr. Chair, I rise to strike the last word. I had asked the I had asked the uh, chairman about including when and looking at the compensation about including the United States Senate. I apologize, Ms. McCollum. Uh, that would be certainly fine with me uh, to uh, include that language at a later point. Um, if there's a way to do that, I don't. There, the whole point of the compensation study is to compare the study of uh, the uh, to compare the salaries of House employees to their peers. So that would include, I think, the Senate, the executive branch, um, uh, the um, private sector. So that, I think, is keeping with the intent of the, of the uh, um, manager's amendment. I'd just like to add to that. Uh, you're recognized. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. <laughs> um, I would just like to add to that. No, no. As we all know, dealing with the Senate and getting information from the Senate about the Senate is not something that they willingly uh, necessarily want to share with us, but the chairman and I have talked about this and uh, with the private sector, but also our relationship to the Senate and the executive branch. So we're going to stay on it. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chair. And um, I'm just going to take a, a second while I strike from the last word, and I have a few minutes, but I won't take that long to talk about the last amendment that just failed. Um, I'm going to, as we move to the floor, hopefully work with um, other members, not just Democratic, I'd like this to be Democratic and Republican members. When we have um, money left at the end of our accounts of the year and we turn them over, a lot of members say, well, I'm putting this towards deficit reduction. It just goes back to the U.S. Treasury. I think we might be able to, um, if, if we wanted to, uh, come up with a, a certain amount of that that we return individually from our offices to go back and to repair for our offices to go into the historic building account fund. So I talked to a couple of people who are interested in it, other people interested in it, please approach me and let's let's see if we can uh, do something. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. McCollum. 
It's high noon, Mr. Kilmer. You have an All amendment right. at the desk? I do. Uh, it, it's Kilmer Cuellar Amendment 1. What, what a team. An amendment offered by Mr. Kilmer and Mr. Cuellar. Red, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I offer this uh, amendment on behalf of myself and, and uh, my good friend, Mr. Cuellar from Texas. I do intend to withdraw it, though I understand that a few members uh, intend to speak on it. Um, this amendment would, would uh, merely estab establish a sense of Congress that the Comptroller General should present an unbiased report on the fiscal state of our nation each year to a joint session of Congress. Uh, the idea was included in a report from a group called Convergence uh, that laid out a number of reforms to our budget and appropriations process. That's something that Ms. Lowy and, and Mr. Womack are leading the charge on as part of the Joint Select Committee on Budget and Appropriations Process Reform, a good committee that needs a shorter title. Um, within that convergence report, this was an idea that was really embraced across the ideological spectrum. In fact, in this Congress, more than 130 bipartisan members have supported this resolution as a standalone bill, including several members of this committee, both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, in the last Congress, I had about 200 sponsors of, uh, from both sides of the aisle. So I just want to take a second and talk about why this matters. And I guess the best way that I can communicate about it is by giving a personal example. So about 10 years ago, uh, I was about 90 pounds heavier than I am now. And uh, only, only my friends, uh, Ms. Herrera Butler and Mr. New look incredible. Yeah, get the donuts as far away as possible, would you? Um, <laughs> I think only my friends, uh, Mr. Newhouse and Ms. Herrera Butler, may remember uh, uh, me as what my daughters loving, re lovingly referred to as Giant Daddy, um, uh, because we served together back in Washington State. But, um, and for a number of years, um, quite candidly, I avoided stepping on a scale. Um, eventually, I figured out that you actually can't get a handle on things uh, by being blissfully ignorant. Occasionally, you actually have to uh, get up on that scale and, conf and confront reality. And frankly, that's the ethic that this amendment seeks to embrace. Um, it simply says if we're going to get a handle on our nation's long-term fiscal challenges and have an economy that works better for everybody and make sure that people now and in the future are able to retire with dignity, we've occasionally got to hear a clear statement of where we are and what our challenges are from a nonpartisan, unbiased source. And we have to function from a common fact base. Um, this is a policy that's been act, uh, advocated by our former Comptroller General, um, by Convergence, by groups like Fix the Debt. Um, I understand that there's a sense that this policy may be better considered as part of the Joint Select Committee on Budget and Appropriations Process Reform, and I will tell you, I would eagerly support that committee taking this up uh, uh, in that regard. Thank you for your personal perspective. Any further comments? Uh, Mr. Cole is recognized. Thank you very much. I want to thank my friend for offering and withdrawing because I actually do think it would be more appropriate. And I hope it does work its way through Mr. Womack's committee. But to your main point, you're absolutely correct. Uh, you know, I sit on the budget committee for eight years. I don't know what I did to offend Chairman Rogers, but that's where I've been. Uh, it was really pretty bad. I told him I'd never do it again. But it's an important exercise because it does not what we do in this room. And many of our own colleagues don't realize that. Recently, we were having a discussion in the Republican conference, and I passed out a chart. It showed defense and uh, OCO funding from 2010 to today after the increases that we've just done, and it was lower. I mean, it was like about 686 back then. It's like about 650 in round numbers now after an $80 billion increase. I did the same thing with non-defense discretionary. It was about 660 in uh, 2010. It's about 658 today. So with inflation, it too has eroded down. And the, you know, the places were obvious. Mandatory was 1.9 trillion then. It's 2.55 trillion now. The debt was, uh, servicing the debt was about uh, uh, 190 billion then. It's about 320, 19 billion dollars now. So having members think about what is really driving the deficit, and I don't say that in terms of Look, we, we in a bipartisan way, and Mr. Delaney and I actually have a bill on this, fix Social Security back in 1983. Uh, and we did it with really relatively small changes, and nobody on the programs lost anything, and they extended the solvency for many, many decades. 
time to do that again, frankly, with the baby boomer generation uh, retiring. But hopefully we'll look at those kind of things. And I want to commend my friend for uh, moving in that direction and helping us educate the rest of Congress about what's really driving the deficit. Yield back, Mr. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Cuellar is recognized, and then Mr. Womack, and we're headed towards the finish line. I hope. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I also want to join my good friend, uh, Mr. Kilmer, on this one. And uh, my understanding is that Mr. Womack is going to uh, hopefully uh, work with us on this language, because I think we all know that there is an issue. I mean, the national debt is over $21 trillion. That's approximately $174,000 uh, per uh, taxpayer. And that's simply only the on-budget. Uh, when the accounting for the off-budget debt, uh, things like the unfunded pension obligations and other items, the amount is actually a lot larger than that. And in order to make our budget sustainable, we must decrease, uh, decrease our deficits by $379 billion every year for the next 75 years, uh, if you keep adding the interest on top of that. So again, we all know what the issue is. Uh, and I hope that, uh, you know, as Democrats and Republicans, we can work together. I have a lot of good faith on uh, my good friend, Mr. Womack. And I think we can hopefully come up with some language that's agreeable uh, to both sides. And I think Mr. Cole said it right. It's an issue that we need to address, and we look forward to working with, uh, with uh, Mr. Womack and Mr. Cole and other folks. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman, uh, Mr. Womack's recognized, and then uh, uh, Mr. Newhouse. I, I, th I thank the chairman. And um, first of all, let me uh, remind everybody in this room that uh, pursuant uh, to the CAPS deal, we do have a joint select committee to study budget process reform uh, that is underway right now, and three of my colleagues on the other side of this aisle uh, are members of that committee in addition to myself, and I have the pleasure and the honor of working with the co-chair of the Joint Select Committee, Ms. Lowy from New York, and, uh, and I don't think there's anybody in this room that would disagree with the notion of putting a little more sunshine publicly on the real problems facing the fiscal situation of our country. It is a bipartisan issue, um, and the Joint Select Committee, uh, while engaged in these discussions right now, those discussions have not matured to the point where we can make recommendations, get it into bill form, uh, and show you exactly what the outcome of this committee will be. And there is a spectrum of issues that we are discussing, not the least of which would be the budget calendar itself. And I think what uh, my friend from the great Pacific Northwest is advocating here would fit in the discussion of what do we do insofar as the budget calendar goes. And so I am ready, willing, and able to uh, work with my co-chair and the other members of the select committee to look at those issues uh, that will drive uh, some of the conclusions of the committee to a uh, to a solution that will work best for everybody. Let me just say this in conclusion, that tomorrow will be our next hearing. And the subject matter of tomorrow's hearing, which has come up today a couple of times, bipartisanship in budgeting. Uh, we are committed to our work, uh, and we will deliver the best product possible. It may not be everything everybody wants, but I promise you, we're going to come up with something that will work for the betterment of the Congress as a whole and the American people. And I thank the chairman. Well, and well, I thank I'm sure on our behalf, uh, we, we commend uh, both you and Ms. Lowy for your leadership. Uh, Ms. Lowy and then Mr. Newhouse. Just briefly, I want to thank my co-chair on this committee. And I know we're both committed to look at the process with all the members of the committee and see if we can come up with some kind of recommendations that really make sense. This has been not just a challenge of the process. I think the politics are tied up with it. For example, today I gather we are getting a rescission package from the White House, and the President wants to make sure that it's bigger than President, former President Reagan's rescission process. So. I think it's not just an issue, as I think we both know, for the Appropriations Committee. It really is an issue, and the challenge is dealing with the whole process, which I think we are committed to doing. So I look forward to continuing to work with you, and as long as we all understand that 
the issue is more than just the appropriations process, more than just the process, too often the politics get mixed up in the process. So I know we are both sincere and working with an outstanding group of <laughs> members, and we look forward to coming, I hope, with some kind of positive suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. Mr. Newhouse, and then we go to Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to quickly stand in support of my colleague from the state of Washington, and he truly is a shadow of his former self, but I hope still a, a gentle or a giant daddy in the eyes of his children. I'm sure he is. Uh, and also to underscore that this is truly a bipartisan effort. Uh, I think uh, partly born out of our bar bipartisan working group, Mr. Renacy had uh, offered this as a, as a piece of legislation that many people on both sides of the aisle in this room supported. And this is truly an issue that is not going away. It's never going to get any easier. And it's something that we truly have to face on behalf of the American people, not just this generation, but future generations. So whatever the right venue, and Mr. Womack, that may be exactly the right place to do this. I just implore all of us to please focus on this so that we can come to a solution and recognize the problem that we have in doing so. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to comment. I know we're talking about the budget, and I think this discussion is important. I want to thank the gentleman for uh, initiating this discussion, but also as appropriators and policymakers, you know, we talk about the entitlements and these programs that people have paid into. The policies we initiate here and fund here have a lot to do with the long-term budget issues that we have. You know, a third of our costs are health care. So the things that we fund or don't fund in this committee with regard to getting healthy food to our kids, with regard to uh, make, how we deal with the farm subsidies, um, urban agriculture, these are all food deserts. These are all huge issues that can bring down health care costs. You look at people graduating from college with huge student debt, it's bad for the economy, lack of investment. Uh, and ability for people to get uh, access to, to loans and capital in order to expand their business. These are all issues we deal with here. So these aren't two separate discussions that we're having. Uh, they're discussions that if we want to attack the long-term budget issues, we've got to be really smart with our investments throughout through this committee. Yield back. Thank you. Uh, I recognize Mr. Kilmer to, uh, for one minute uh, on an amendment he's planning to withdraw. You got it. Um, thank you, Chairman. And I just want to thank our, our co-chairs, Ms. Lowy and Mr. Womack, for their leadership on what I think is a really important conversation for the, for the Congress. Appreciate my colleagues for weighing in on it. And with that, I do withdraw. Thank you very much. Uh, any further amendments? Uh, seeing none, uh, I recognize the gentleman from Alabama for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to favorably report the Legislative Branch Appropriation Bill for FY19 to the House. The questions on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, can we have a recorded vote on that, please? Okay. The recorded vote is requested. An adequate number of hands. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Aye. Mr. Adderholt, aye. Mr. Aguilar. Aye. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amaday. Yes. Mr. Amaday, yes. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert, aye. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, aye. Mr. Cartwright, Mr. Cartwright, Ms. Clark, yes. Ms. Clark, yes. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Culberson, aye. Mr. Culberson, aye. Ms. Deloro, aye. Ms. Deloro, aye. Mr. Dent, aye. Mr. Dent, aye. Ms. Mr. Diaz Ballard, aye. Mr. Diaz Ballard, aye. Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, yes. Mr. Freelinghuisen. Aye. Mr. Freelinghuisen, aye. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger, aye. Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, aye. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Ms. Herrera Butler, yes. Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, yes. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor, aye. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer, aye. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCullum. Ms. McCullum, aye. Mr. Meng. Ms. Meng. Sorry. Ms. Meng, aye. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, aye. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, aye. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, aye. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, yes. Mrs. Roby. 
Mrs. Roby, aye. Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rooney. Mr. Rooney, aye. Ms. Roybal Allard, Ms. Roybal Allard, aye. Mr. Rupersberger, Mr. Rupersberger, aye. Mr. Ryan, aye. Mr. Ryan, aye. Mr. Serrano, Mr. Serrano, Mr. Simpson, Mr. Simpson, aye. Mr. Stewart, Mr. Stewart, aye. Mr. Taylor, Mr. Taylor, aye. Mr. Valadeo, Mr. Valadeo, aye. Mr. Vesklosky, Mr. Vesklosky, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, yes. Mr. Yoder. Mr. Yoder, aye. Mr. Young. Mr. Young, yes. Are there any members who wish to uh, record their vote or change their vote? Uh, seeing none, the clerk will tally. Clerk will tally. You have another? Uh, how is how is the gentleman from Pennsylvania recorded? Yes. Thank you Mr. Very Cartwright, much. yes. Cartwright. Okay. Uh, on this vote, the 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 eyes are forty seven. And there are no nays, and the bill is approved, uh, reported out. Uh, and I ask for unanimous consent that the staff be given authority to make technical and conforming change to the items approved today. Without objection, uh, so ordered. And I'd like to thank everybody for their attention and, and hard work today. Uh, three days. Thank you, Ms. Lowy. Committee's now adjourned. Thank you very much.